Imagine, if you will, yourself at 19, your first steps into adulthood. I don't know, maybe you're at uni, maybe you're experimenting with places and skills that might become your career. Maybe you're partying because you just feel like partying. You feel like going hard out. That's fine. Either way, most of us know what it feels like to be 19. If you're not 19 yet, I'm sure you can imagine how excited you're going to be. But yeah, if you're older than that, you remember what it's like to feel full of energy, full of ideas, really kind of starting to shape, uh, I guess, a, a version of what might be the first go at our adult identity. If you're anything like me, you are unstoppable, invincible, 10 foot tall, bulletproof, no hill too steep to skate down, no shot too strong to throw down, no gig too big to rock like it was my last gig on earth. And that 19-year-old power, it really is something, isn't it? Now, just imagine, if you will, that in the middle of that youthful energy and, and drive and the kind of shaping of your adult self, just by a complete random chance, you get sick. I mean, really sick. So sick, you end up in hospital. And through a haze of painkillers and other medications, the doctors tell you that it's meningococcal septicemia. You end up in a coma. Things get really, really bad. Worse. To save your life, you lose both legs and both arms. It takes a long time to get well. Eventually, you leave hospital. And now you're 19 and a quadruple amputee. How long do you think it would take for you to heal from that? Well, for Tom Nash, also known as DJ Hookie, it isn't until kind of now, in his 40s, that he believes he has truly begun to heal. Tom and I go way, way back to when he was a club promoter with his mate Chris in King's Cross at a, a party that used to run called Starfuckers. It was heaps of fun. Tom first came on the podcast in 2019. We spoke about his battle with meningococcal septicemia how he learned who his real friends are, how he had to relearn how to do what he loved. Now, in more recent years, Tom has become quite the in-demand keynote speaker. He's regularly presenting ideas and philosophies just steeped in the lessons from life that he spent overcoming this adversity. His TEDx talk uh, the perks of being a pirate has been seen by over two and a half million people. His experiences have given him a unique outlook on life and a, a real belief that while everyone has their own personal challenges and everything's relative, it's how you deal with them that matters. Tom's journey is a testament to the strength of the human spirit, really, the power of determination. I absolutely adore Tom Nash. His outlook on life is just stunning and one that I personally really take a lot from. We're really very lucky that a lot of the lessons which Tom has fought very hard to learn, he's generously sharing, not only in this podcast, but also in his new book. It's brilliant. Hook, line, and sinner. Hey, eh? So good. I love a pun in the title. <laughs> Today, Tom and I are going to talk a lot. We're going to talk about healing, about how he transformed almost unspeakable adversity into an opportunity for growth. The man's an inspiration. He's also hilarious. And I just can't wait for you to hear this. How are you, Tom? Really good. How are you? Mate, I'm all right. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me in this new brilliant st studio that you have. Wow, that's a... I, I wasn't even across the fact that you now do this uh, as video. But you just get around through the day just looking... This way, anyway. Yeah, this is how exactly. you lucky because yeah. I was going to turn up here looking homeless, being like, "Oh, this is Osher, a couple of microphones, mate." No, we'll I'm be fine. <laughs> I am a t-shirt away from my pajamas right now. Okay, fine. Like this, well, but this is how I go through my day. This is I dress like this all the time. I know you do. That's fine. It's a good thing. Hang on. Mm. It's the afternoon. I'm having a cup of tea. It's a it's a beautiful thing, and I'm I'm glad you came back, man. I had such a nice time speaking with you last yeah. time. But you've written a book since we last yes. spoke. Yes, yes, absolutely. And there's a lot to discuss because mm. the world is a the world's a different place, and some of the things that we talked about last time 
uh, which I would encourage people to go and visit because um, there's no need to cover too much of it again. Um, yeah. And if not, I'll, I'll fill them all in in the intro. Yes. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, a lot of what we discussed, there was kind of the, the germinations of the way you look at the world that I'm kind of wondering where they are. Because I've always enjoyed the refreshing way that you look at the world. Mm. And it's a very matter of fact way. Yeah, like a no-nonsense pragmatic way. And in, with and, no room for, <laughs> yeah, and terror. also a very a very humanist way mm. of looking things. But people may misjudge the way you approach life because of the, mm. what they see when they see you. But I've always found it so extraordinarily refreshing to hear your take on on things, almost to the point where I'd be happy if we spent an hour not even talking about. It. <laughs> we can talk about whatever you want, but also Anything. I kind of like it when people misjudge me because then it gives me a reason to say something. Mm. Mm. Because the trope with anyone who's differently abled, look, for years, they were the baddie in the Bond film, mm. you know? Which I think I'd do a good job of. Fuck yeah, you would. Dr. No Hands. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <sighs> Continue with your thought. No, look, look, uh, look, I'm just letting that dad joke kind of really hit. Now, bear in mind, I work on the Must Singer at the moment. We stack it, we stack it hard with bad puns. Oh, yeah, every, do um, you really? But Dr. No Hands. Do you is, write them? Oh, Yeah. By the way, I saw you're up for a gold logie. A gold logie. Congratulations. Thanks, man. This will air after that comes out. So who, oh. who knows how I went? Okay, right. You know, but it's one of these things, Tom, that I have no control over mm. the outcome. It's a publicly voted thing. Yeah. I've got no control over it. Do, can I vote? Yeah. How do you do it? You just go on the website. You just go on the website. Yeah, there's a mean? thing in the show there's notes. A service you, you've got to go like, through. You... Yes. Yeah, you've got to type in your license plate. Um <laughs> But you just go to the TV Wigwood website and, okay. and vote, but you've got to vote for everyone before you get to the gold. Um, but it is one, oh, of, those, it's one of those things. Onerous. That, yeah. Also, I, I'm not a big uh, TV watcher, particularly when it comes to sort of the it's, free to air stuff. It's, so. it's like, you know, I'm sure it's people fill that stuff out like I'm sure they fill out their, you know, their grade, voting, their their grade 10, <laughs> you know, their grade 10 multiple choice. <laughs> Um, tests. I like you were going to say like C for everything. I'll average <laughs> the census or something. Yeah, there's eighty right. people living here. Who gives a yeah, shit? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's one of those things where, you know, it's a real clear line for me because when I first met you, it was a very different time in my life. And we spoke about this last time. In that, I was just boy, man. I was drinking. I was using. I was doing all kinds of things to keep the kind of sense of self-worth and the realisation of how little I accepted what was happening to me in that I was being quite successful at the time and how much I was trying to destroy that mm. and, and hide from it to the point where I would my teeth would grind and I would seethe with rage when I wouldn't see my name nominated for anything and I would see other people um, get, you know, shows mm. that I wanted to get on and, and then because I'd attach myself to the outcome and it was only after kind of getting dragged through the absolute shit um, that uh, I, I had to kind of understand that I can only control what I can control. Yeah, and also enjoying the process as well That's along the way, is. right? So everything yeah. that leads up to that outcome, whatever it may be, like being able to appreciate yeah. that is half the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, even if you do achieve the yeah. thing, you just move on to wanting the next thing and never yeah. actually have an instance where you feel happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you comfortable sitting back or sitting forward? Which one do you want? It's up to I, you. I, can I oscillate? You can. You can do okay, whatever you I'm going to oscillate. No, you should oscillate. For, for effect. Oh, I if I it. say anything poignant, I'll lean in. This is very important. So and as you leave, if you don't <laughs> fling the scarf over your, like, yeah. as you go, I'll be most disappointed. Okay. I, I will like, do that. Scarf's always Straight a good exit. Straight to camera. <laughs> yeah. Um, people are listening to uh, a vape being sucked, by the way. I thought those things Well, were... I was hoping that they were watching it as well. Well, Tell me something. Yeah. Are there more people that watch or listen? It depends on what, you know, depends. Okay. It all depends. At the moment, listening. At the moment, li more listeners. But who knows? Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, like well, many because it's a bit okay. So for me, in particular, whenever I do podcasts, um, nobody knows who I am because why should they? Uh, they should know that I have two hooks for hands. Yes, that's kind of the reason I get asked on podcasts in the beginning. I'm not t frightfully interesting or anything, but it's uh, piffle through you this are, uh, through this lens. I dispute. Uh, I'm not frightfully interesting because of the way that you look at the world is something that I get. I said again. I said I really, I really relish and how you came and we covered this a bit last time is how you came to be in this space of observing the world, and observing challenge, and mm. observing things. I'm, I'm not going to say it was forced upon you, but you really had no choice. No, yeah, it matter. was absolutely forced upon me. Yeah, 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 yeah. and. and the pathway you came out of that could have so easily been resentment and could have so easily been 
I, I deal with it a bit. You know, I deal with, you know, people who are, you know, online and they say stuff and then you kind of ask them what's going on and then it turns out, oh, this is going on in my life. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. right, there's a lot of stuff out of your control that's happening to you and you're being angry at other people. Almost everything is out of your control. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you're being angry. You're being angry that you can't change it. So weird, Yeah, that's weird. right. Yeah. So that, ang- that anger could really consume you. Mm. And I'm wondering um, – what was this? I don't know. We didn't really cover this too much last time. Was there, at what point do they say, okay, Tom, here's all the antibiotics we can give you. And here's, you know, here's the OT, here's this, and here's the therapist. Mm. At what point does that show up? Oh, the therapist thing. Yeah, that uh, pretty early in the piece, actually. Yeah. I had a, a psychologist given to me when I was in Concord Hospital, so mm-hmm. I would have been about two months in. Yeah to hospital and I'd been through coma. I'd had both legs amputated and both arms amputated. And they sent me this guy. Uh, he was, I won't mention his name. He was very, very nice. But he was, uh, I guess, soporific. He, like he, the, the dulcet tones of his voice would actually put me to sleep. And so he was a psychiatrist or a psychologist. He was a really nice guy. I didn't find any of the method useful at all, but he did put me to sleep, which was kind of good because I couldn't really get much sleep at that at no. that time because I was in so much pain. Yeah. So just send in the psychologist and you'll be out like a light. <laughs> <laughs> Did you seek out someone to kind of help you get your head around? No, they were often forced upon me. I don't tend to respond well to one-on-one treatment from psychologists, in, not in a negative way, just it, I, I don't really get much from it mm-hmm. personally. Um, I don't know why that is. I think I, I like to sound out ideas with the people in my own orbit that might be friends and family. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it wouldn't be in a very obvious way, but just having people around who are not in your position and living their lives to the fullest, I guess, or just in, an, in a normal fashion is the best way for you to be able to reflect. And, and then you have time on your own to reflect on that. I think that's... That's my style of doing things. I haven't really found it mm. useful speaking to psychologists. But, you know, different horses, different courses. Did Was there a moment where, because resentment or righteousness are both extraordinarily seductive places, because if you hold on to one or the other, then you don't have to do any looking inwards. Mm. Um, did those two things show up? Resentment and what was the other one? Being righteous. Being righteous. Uh I try to be righteous as much as I can. Oh, but, <laughs> I guess I'm more. I'm more like. Um, well, at least resentment, as, as in. Yeah. Like, that, that's well, a, that's yeah, a, I guess a, an easy way. Not an easy way out. That is a seductive way and an understandable way to handle what's happened to you. Yeah, that's right. I guess it would be. And it, for often, a lot of people, I think, is a default. It, the the trope of kind of why me, um, until you realise why not me. It's going to happen to someone, isn't it? Like I'm no different from anyone else. I'm not special. You know, someone's going to lose their arms and legs this year. May as well be you. You can't take credit for how you respond to situations, I don't think, at least not entirely. There's got to be some component of of nature to it, I think, and then there's an element of luck. Uh, then there's an element of the support of the people around you. And I think if you are to be credited for a- in any way for how you respond to situations, it would be in a very minute way. Mm. But often we we tend to try to simplify it more than that and think, oh, this person has just done remarkably well and and better than somebody else could have. Uh, well, there's a multitude of factors for that, and I, I probably had no choice in the way that I dealt with things. So righteousness doesn't play into it by default. Yeah. Uh, and resentfulness, uh, I try to be as resentful as I can, just not about things like getting meningococcal, but... Things like uh, being on hold for too long, uh, two ply tissues, or anything below, waiting in a line or a queue. I'm highly resentful of all these things, <laughs> uh, and that keeps me grounded. And those things, I think, these are things are fair. Yeah, you know, if you're going to choose what you're going to get fucked off about, <laughs> that's right. If I go to someone's house and they haven't got two plies, like honestly, like I've lived in share houses where we couldn't rub, you know two bits of resin together to, f- to pack a cone. Mm. <laughs> but we always, always bought the most expensive toilet paper we could afford. That's good. I like that philosophy. And the best quality tomato sauce. No, no, it's home brand shit. Tomato sauce, as in, when you say tomato sauce, do you mean ketchup or do you mean Italian tomato sauce? No, like no, no. Like, or no, no, no. Like, like in a tube. Yeah, yeah. ketchup. 
Ketchup. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's what's your definition of the best ketchup? Is it Heinz? Uh yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. a Heinz guy 57. as well. Yeah. I yeah, think but so. I think that's the taste that some people in Brisbane, there was this wild brand called Big Red. And I've heard of Big Red. It was yeah. like the size of a bottle was the size of like something you'd now get at Costco and think that's small. Yeah, but at the like time, some it was like what post-war God, paint is package this thing? And so sauce. unrecyclable. And so unrecyclable. That was no, your problem with it? No, and it was, and it was no, I was four. <laughs> But I remember this this bottle being so big I could barely lift it and the mm. taste being like this. I don't know what this is. You say it's tomato sauce, but no. Mm. Can I go back home? I know this is a sleepover, but I'd like to go home now, please. So so good ketchup, yeah. good toilet paper. Start there. Yeah, I and, think so. I've been your... in five-star hotels with two-ply tissues. Oh, what God. the fuck is going on? That's what they've got high-thread count linens for. Yeah, they've got high-thread <laughs> thread count linens, <laughs> but two-ply tissues. Yeah, just get in, get in there. They'll you know, it's gotten to the point where... Uh, because I make a big deal about this wherever I go. Mm. And one of the places that I go regularly is my prosthetist, people who make my hooks and everything like that. And, you know, on a bad week, I'm there like, on a bad month, I'm there about one, once a week or something like that. And they always had these two ply tissues in every room. And so I, I made a bit, I kicked up a big stink about it. And then they started putting three ply tissues in all the rooms. So I thought, okay, we're making some progress. Then as time went on, they would only put them in the room that I was supposed to be in. And so often I would find myself going to other rooms and I'd be like, hang on a second. So uh, APC Prosthetics, if you're listening, <laughs> make with a three-ply. <laughs> I'm going to cut that up put on TikTok as well. Just make sure they listen. <laughs> when it comes to something like a prosthetic, uh, I don't know this. I mean, I, the only thing I can raise is with with my hearing aids, is mm. that you get a phone call going, hey, man, we've got this new thing in. Yeah. Does this. And, oh, yeah. Do they do that for the hearing aids, but yeah, they've got yeah. to yell it? Or- oh, no, no. There's like, <laughs> the, I've been wearing hearing aids about seven, eight years now, and the versions now are like astounding compared Cochlear? to- Cochlear? No, 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 I don't have a, no, no. Just have you, have you ever considered that? I don't need it. Right. No, I just literally have nothing above 3K. Mm, maybe mm. in that ear, maybe a little bit above that. In the yeah, right, right okay. But, yeah, so I know you're saying the letter S because the words in context make sense. Right, okay, yeah. Trying to understand something like Mandarin, yeah, which has lots of sure sounds in it. I you, you've got a natural de on oh, the dude. side of your head. <laughs> That's a way to look at it. <laughs> it's a way to look at it. Um, I should really wear them more often, but I, mm. but I don't. But I'm wondering, do the does the... Does your prosthetist call you up and say, dude, there's this thing no, coming? They know me better not to say that <laughs> yeah. because I'm I'm quite a traditionalist with my prosthetics. I've had these hooks for, you know, 20 years now and they were designed 120 years ago uh, for people who lost their arms in the trenches. That's why they've got those little holes for cigarettes. Yes. You see. Um, but if there's any edits to be made to my uh, prosthetics, I will usually discuss it with them, things that I would want. For instance, I had a, an Apple Watch built into this one. And I've got a bottle opener here. You can That's see that. That's so sick. Which is great. It's actually a better party trick than it is practically useful to me. I don't drink beer. Uh, often I'll have a gin and tonic, so I have like those fever tree bottles I can open. Mm. But more often than not, I'll just be out somewhere and someone's like, bottle opener, and I can just go, Psh. It's great. <laughs> it was really good. I, I had a belt buckle that had a bottle opener in it. Man, yeah. you just like, I think Mick Fanning released a thong that had a bottle opener in the bottom of it a long time ago. Really? Yeah, there was a flip flop. How'd that happen? How'd that work? No. It had a hole in the. There was an in- actual bottle opener in the sole of the shoe. Oh. Yeah. Wow. That that brings shoey to another level, doesn't it? Because, <laughs> of course, you couldn't. You couldn't then you couldn't open the beer and then do a shoe because you didn't have to wear a shoe oh, and yeah, the thong with the bottle opener. Let's not talk about shoeys. <laughs> oh my god, that stuff is. That's wrong. But look, I'm get, like, is it like I've got uh, I've got an iPad in that drawer that mm. no longer works mm. because they're like, we're just going to not update that anymore, and it's not fast enough to do anything. Like, is yeah. there a point where the people that know how to make these things are going to be like, dude, I'm retiring, and I'm literally the last person in Australia who can fix that for you? That's an interesting point. No, there are plenty of prosthetists who can fix these and make them, uh, but. An interesting point about the technology, you know, at what point do they stop making hooks in favour of, you know, new electric hands? Mm. I actually don't think that's a problem. They're kind of mass produced by this company in America who charge ridiculous amounts of money for them and they're basically just a mould. But a lot of people actually use these, the the hooks, because they're far more functional than the hands Mm. and uh, I think they're more functional than the electronic hands as well. 
And, you know, who wants to be carrying around something that requires charging? Like, we we have so many things in our lives. You know, the phone, the watch, the AirPods, the fucking... Like, I don't want to have to plug my arms in every eight hours or when I'm traveling or something like that. No, get rid of it. Nobody wants that. No one wants it, yeah. I'll tell you what I would do. If they could make arms, uh, if they could grow arms through stem cells, something like that. And I spoke to my friend Meow about this, who was contending that if you could create the bone out of, so rather than growing bone, but you would make the bone out of titanium, which mm. is stronger than bone. Mm. I don't know how they would do that, but then you would grow I've tissue got a over it. Of it. So don't worry, it's fine. Well, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Right. So you'd have to sort of craft it in a way and then grow the hand or the, the ligaments and the flesh on top of that such that they could surgically attach them to you, but they're part of your own physiology so you wouldn't have to take anti-rejection drugs. Yeah. I'd give that a go, I think. I dare say that that'll be, this is the obviously the dream mm. of, uh, you know, I had a, a joke when I first got my hip replacement. It's like, he said, oh, they last about 20 years. I'm like, well, I guess by then you'll be 3D printing it out of my own stem cells. He goes, yeah, that's what we're working towards. I'm like, I bet you are. I bet they are, right? Yeah. But I remember back when I lost my arms, they're like, oh, we'll be able to do arm transplants in 10 years. And I'm like, will you though? Will you? Or even if you can, how commonplace will it be? Yeah, shoot for the moon, Tom. Such that I can yeah. <laughs> shoot for the moon, buddy. I, I think I'm just going to – I think I'll have these until the day I die. Yeah. Um, and that's the attitude that I'm taking. And if some technology comes along in 20 years – but then again, I've got to think to myself as well, like this, be, this has become a part of me. Yeah, yeah. You know, how weird would it feel to have hands again? Uh, there was a, uh, a moment, like a milestone that happened for me a couple of years ago where I realized that I'd been disabled longer than I wasn't. Which was a strange realization. Was it, you know, I think I would have been thirty-eight or something like that, because I, I got sick when I was nineteen. Yeah. So I turned thirty-eight, and I thought, oh, interesting. And you know, you regard time differently when you're younger. It obviously seems like it goes for a longer time mm. because as a percentage of your life, uh, it's larger. But it was interesting to note that I actually felt like I was, I felt like I had more memories as a disabled person than I did without you know, as a able-bodied person. Yeah. Yeah. It was weird. So now, a couple of years in, I've, I've been disabled way longer than I was able-bodied, which feels good. It, feel, it feels good to be here. Um, mate, to finally arrive. It always feels good. It always <laughs> feels good to be in your presence. I've got to tell you, man. And this is, because the, the largest thing that's happened since we saw each other last, besides, you know, well, for me, we had a we had a son here at our place, but yeah. no one of us could leave the house, mm. and a lot of people lost their fucking minds and yeah. channeled a lot of frustration into resentment and into anger at others and into mm. you know a lot of really dangerous places that I am you know I'm concerned some parts of our society are going to have a really hard time getting back from. What was it like for you to be observing people lose their shit? over an unpredictability or a, a sense of helplessness, something that you had clearly figured out how to deal with? Mm. Uh, I found it really interesting uh, because obviously people had so many different reactions. And so, you know, not to say that everybody found it terrible. Some people really enjoyed it even. Mm. And uh, But the one thing that I did notice was that it was it was the first time society – all had the same problem. Mm -hmm. And also that uh, it was the first time that industries at large had been forced to make changes mm -hmm. and been forced to think differently. And I think the link that I always found with myself was I was once the one that was forced to think differently to solve problems. And often people aren't given that gift, which I do think is a gift experiencing some sort of negative vicissitude or, or whether it be a tragedy or adversity or a challenge that you're forced to think of a different way around a problem or several problems. And mostly people aren't put in that position. So it's it, very interesting to watch how different industries coped the whole working from home thing and how people got used to that. Some people really liked it more than others. Some people hated it. It really divided people along the lines of uh, introverts and extroverts, mm -hmm. I found. And then there were some businesses that r completely rethought the way that they did work, which was like, okay, well, we have all this real estate mm. that's an outgoing expense that we don't really need. We can have people work working distributed, but there's also an element where we don't we do want people to come together because that's how we share ideas, that's how we socialize. And if people are 
sitting at home and they don't leave their house for a week, they can start to get depressed. And a Zoom conference is not a good substitute for that. It no. just isn't, right? And actually, weirdly, I had to do, because I work as a speaker now, and I pre- previously was doing a lot of events, and then I had to do digital events, you know, I online. did a few of them. You did a yeah, few did of those, a few online right? conferences, yeah. Um, and it was it was kind of awful because you don't get that immediate response that you do no. when you're speaking to groups of people. You can't, even if you make jokes or you make people laugh, all you do is you see these tiny little faces on a screen just like, yeah. And I'm just like, I, I, I can't do this. It's yeah. not. It's a rhetorical exercise, but I need to have some sort of feedback yeah. and a strange feeling of just still being in your house once it was all done. Yeah. You know, like you finish this huge conference, could be like hundreds of people, blah, 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 and then you just switch it off and go and feed the dog. Like it's a, it's a strange thing we were doing there for a while. Um, but it had some positives to it, which is that I, I got to do a lot of work for American uh, companies mm-hmm. that I wouldn't have been able to do yeah. because they have to fly me and another person out to the States and then they have to put us up in accommodation and their budget doesn't stretch that far. But they've got a, a budget that if they give it to you, you can jump on a Zoom call. Fantastic. Yeah. And so a lot of companies had access to people and things uh, that they, I, w- I don't want to say they didn't have it before, but it was normalized, mm. right? So everybody could have worked distributed before the pandemic, the technology had been there for years, yeah. right? But nobody wants to be the first company to do it, do they? Mm. Because the, the first person to make a big change pays a disproportionately high price if that doesn't eventuate or it doesn't work. So if you're the person in a company that makes the decision to get everyone distributed work and it fucks up in your face, you get fired. And so no one, no one makes that decision. With the pandemic, it forced everyone to make decisions like that and mm. change the way that they thought. And I think now we're in a position where, you know, in the wake of all of that, we can choose the things that still work and we can do away with the stuff that doesn't. It was very tough on a lot of industries. Um, some absolutely thrived. If you're in the mask game, you're doing great. If, in we, the if, mask you, if you were making rat tests, you're yeah. killing it. All right. If you were in hospo, yeah. if you're a musician. Yeah, it was a nightmare, right? And Forget and about it. Us running Starfuckers as well, that was completely... You know what? We ran our last Starfuckers, we did a Mardi Gras, our Party Gras party, I think five days before lockdown came in March 2020. We just, just got in there, but it was like the next weekend, nobody could go anywhere. Yeah. We just slid in there. And so... I always knew you as a DJ. I always knew you as a party promoter, right? Mm. The speaking and the writing stuff is uh, fairly recent for you. That's a huge part of your identity that's just... I wouldn't say it's part of my identity. It's part of my work. Well, <laughs> you, I, I, I disagree. So you are, yeah. you are one of the lucky few, I'm one of the lucky few, who has a job that is in alignment with kind of who they are or how they move through the world or definitely in alignment with their values. Like mm. this job, this is a job now, the podcast thing. I love it. Mm. It's a job, but it is part of my identity. It's like, oh, no, no, this is what I this is what I do and I love to do it. Yes. And I love to be there for people and I love to make this thing for people. But which came first? Does the podcast create your identity or do you lean into the podcast, the podcast because it creation, is part of your identity? As a de- and I'm going to say this to you, I'd say you created the party out of a reflection of like, I want to make a party I want to go to. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And that's- the- whether, whether I was successful at doing that is up for debate, but yeah. <laughs> you, you ran a party longer than most other people. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the podcast was a reflection of, mm. it was always been a reflection of like, I want to make a podcast, always been, I want to make a podcast I want to listen to. But then does it become what people know you by and therefore inform your sense of identity by dint of its success. More than anything else, this show that you're on right now mm. does. People often, if they've just heard the podcast for the first time, they're like, I really didn't expect that. It's like, no, because if you only know me screaming at a giant toothbrush, take it off, why would you think anything else? That's fine. Mm. Or if you only know me whispering, canning some flowers, yeah, that's fine. But that's not who I am. Because mm. that's not the job. That's the job. Mm. Those two things, I love them. I love yeah. doing them. But they're jobs. This is the thing, though. So I have a similar experience in that everything that I've ever done has always been viewed through the lens of, oh, the guy with hooks did that thing, right? So if you assessed me as a DJ, you would say, yeah, okay, DJ, nothing special. But DJ with two hooks, oh, okay, all of a sudden we're listening, right? 
And I get that. But to a point, it, it becomes difficult to be regarded as improving, let's say. So I had a very asymptotic relationship with uh, getting better as a DJ. When I started out, I was shit. I uh, couldn't DJ at all. And then, uh, but people still enjoyed watching me play. And then as I got better and better, I began to experience diminishing returns because the lion's share of what they liked about me DJing was the fact I was DJing with two hooks. And so, and that's what I mean by it being sort of this non-linear benefit uh, graph, I guess you'd call it. And uh, the first time I, I'd, I'd told Chris about this, you know, many times and he, he kind of got what I meant, but I, I guess not fully. He's quite close to me, so he he knows, you know, when I get better at something, he'll he'll recognize it. And he largely sees past my disability. We were touring Japan once, and I was with my partner at the time, uh, Sydney, who is uh, quite tall uh, for a girl and uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. She's a fashion model. And Chris is very tall, and he's very striking. And I look like I do. And so when we're walking through Japan... We got a lot of looks. It's very right? homogenous society. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're just like, everyone was. And we, we went to play this uh, club in Tokyo called Club Asia. And I remember- In us, Tokyo? It's, yeah. <laughs> and we went into the into the club and there's a queue of people on the other side. I'm like, aren't you meant to cl- uh, queue up outside the club? No, these people were queued inside the club to get photos with us. Huh. Right? Just because we looked so different. Yeah. And the whole set that we played, there was like 30 people and we just sit there and they come and get a selfie and they move on and blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, the whole set that we played, there were maybe about 200 people in the club and they're sort of dancing, but they're all facing the same way and they're just taking photos of us. Because we're this, you know, like yeah. Chris is like six foot four and I've got these hooks for like these freaks of nature or whatever it is. Yeah, right. And uh, I remember him saying to me afterwards, he's like, oh, he's like, I get it now. When there's that visual aspect to what you do and, and they're not, like they're listening to the music, but that's not the most important thing yeah. to them. Is like I, I get how you feel sometimes with that, right. yeah. And so that w- when you link something like that with your identity, just like you were saying with the giant toothbrush thing, mm. how do you get people past that? Or do you even is it even your responsibility to get them past that? Oh, to answer your question, I would say it's not my job. I just. As I mentioned earlier in that conversation, I used to live and die by the overnight numbers. And uh, as I'm sure you would live and die, like by how many people bought a ticket to your show, right? Yeah. To your party. And then realized that I can't control any of that. I don't work at promos. I don't market. I I can't control if something is on another channel. I can't control if the greatest football game ever played is going on air at the same time as we are. I can't control any of that. All I can control is how good a job I do. Mm. And if that job is to stand there in an amazing suit and shout as an anthropomorphic, you know, toilet washer, um, <laughs> take it off, Yeah, I'll do that the best I possibly can. And mm. it's preposterous and I love it because it means nothing. Of all the jobs I do, it means absolutely nothing because mm. no one's emotions to get. They're already famous people. They don't care. Mm. It means it's brilliant. Yeah. I adore it. Uh, because it, so your your position is now currently to take a back seat with respect to people's expectations of you. Is that right? Not when it comes to delivering the job. Like mm. I am hired because I'm the best option they have. Anyone mm. you know has that. You know they, they were the best opportunity they're hired at the time, mm. and I work really hard to stay as good as I possibly can at doing what I do. Yeah, whether that be the whispery thing or the shouty thing or this but again because of what you mentioned earlier. I want to, there was one. I want to have some ascension mm. in in my career. You know, people start. You know, they start in the mailroom. For example, the trope is you start in the mailroom and you work your way up. Mm. All right, I was on air at twenty five. Mm. Did you, you, you work your way up to the mailroom? Like, <laughs> no. Well, where do you go from there? <laughs> you, plenty of people work their way down. Um, <laughs> exactly. But where do you go? Where do you go from there? Like, I, I just want to try to be. I just want That's to, a really good question. Where do you go from yeah, there? Yeah, where do you go from there? Well, yeah, I figured yeah. I figured out where to go. The first yeah. I figured out where to go is that just try to just be as good as I possibly can be mm. at the one thing that I do better than other people. Yeah. And that's it. Give yeah. everything else up because there's so much space between where I'm good enough at what it is that gigantic networks with million dollar budgets, huge multi-million dollar budgets go, mm. that's the guy. Mm. We'll hire him over anybody else. And that's 
what they hire, but I know the gap between what they see and what I'd like to be. Yeah. Well, that's, I guess, what I'm getting at. Like, how, to what extent does that drive you to do more of this kind of stuff, which is like your- Oh, significantly actually, yeah, so. Right. Significantly so. But this is also, I, I, you know, I truly believe, you know, and I'm sure this is how, you know, the book came to you in that I started this podcast because the kind of conversations that I needed to hear to help me get out of a shitty spot, I wasn't hearing, all right? Mm. I was hearing them in particular places, um, in- fellowship meetings and, and such, but I wasn't hearing them in the public space. Mm. And you can't be what you can't see. And my only job- You can't be what you can't see? No. What do you mean by that? Can you explain that to me? If someone had been through the same thing that you had mm. and you had not forged your path, there's no one to point at on the poster on the wall and say, look at him. He did it. So, for example, when I first do you, looked, do you mean to say that, that everybody follows a kind of archetype or a blueprint? That, that not essentially, by just like or? oh, it can be done. Right. Okay. It can be done. You know, if you never, if, if you don't realize that, um, for example, with you know, with with G, if like if she if she never saw a woman in a position of power, she'd be like, well, I guess I'll never be in a position of power. You know, for mm. years, um, you know, uh, the queer community was like, I'll never be accepted. I'll never be able to marry someone. I'll never be able to have children. And then some sort of wild kind of way of looking at the world. And, and plus, there's a, in, if we go back long enough, there's a disease that no one cares about that's killing all of my friends. There's mm. no life for me. Mm. And I, if you can't see that, you can, like, hold on, man. There's a thing called prep that's going to change everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, why would you even try? Why would you, you know, it's, it's really hard. You know, I've, mm. I've, spoken to, I've spoken to men who lived through that time and yeah. they speak about that. So I, I think it's really important to, particularly when it comes to feeling better or getting better or, um, Getting your way out of a of a of a tricky situation around health, at least, mm. particularly mental health. Hearing stories of how someone who is kind of where you were or, and is now somewhere where you want to be is vitally important because mm. otherwise, I, I needed to hear stories of people who got sober. I needed to hear stories of people who were insane mm. and who were now not insane because I was fucking crazy. And I needed yeah. to hear stories of people who had gotten better, like because it was a fairy story. It was a, like imaginary. It was literally the South Park episode, stage one, you know, steal other pants, stage two, stage three, profit. Like, it was just this gigantic in the middle. Yeah. Like, insane, something, mm. better. I couldn't put it together. Mm. And so these kind of conversations are very important, I feel. Mm. And, and so what I, you know, I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately. Like, the only job that I have is to make people feel less alone, whether that is on telly, doing, you know, big shiny floor TV shows or, you know, romantic reality TV shows or um, this news show that I've been working on, which is really fun, or this podcast. My only job mm. is to give people the idea that I got you. I mm. see you there. Yeah, I, I have often strived, I think, to find something relatable in my story that could could be relatable to anyone so, so not necessarily, I mean, I would be hard pressed to find many people that have gone through specifically what I have, mm -hmm. uh, which would give me, you know, quite a narrow audience if I was being honest. Um, but I think, and the, the kernel that began wanting to write this book, cause I'd always wanted to write a book, but I was always too young. I hadn't had enough experiences. Mm. And, uh. And Chuka's forgetting a drug line in the, uh, in literally in the opening, in the title. <laughs> yeah. it was a good job. Um. Yeah, I, I needed to have that life experience, but I also needed to do something of note. It couldn't just be, you know, got through having a disability and, hey, I'm still here. I think I think that would be largely boring. Yeah. Um, not completely useless to some people, I guess, but I, I wanted to be, to, it to be more than that. I knew instinctually. So um, even though I think, you know, the age of 40 is probably early to be writing a memoir. I was 44 um, when I wrote mine. Yeah, right. It's a halftime report. That's what I, yeah, I, I like to call mine a semiography. So, <laughs> yeah. Good. But I think there's enough in there now and there's enough for me to reflect on that I think I can I can conjure up some salient lessons of things that I've learned that can be applied to people yeah. regardless of who you are. Yeah. You know, you, you don't have to have gone through some tragedy. You don't have to be disabled at all uh, to take something away from that. And I think since about 2019, I've been working pretty hard to – package those into speaking gigs that I do and then also into literature. I guess something that's transferable. And this them. is the thing, you know, people uh, at this point, I'm not going to say you're learning to DJ, you know, similarly, but. No, you're always learning to DJ. You're always, yeah, yeah. always learning to DJ. Um, 
God, if I listened back to the other one that we That's did. That's half the problem, by the way. Yeah. Everyone's <laughs> learning how to teach. I, lis- I listened back disaster. to the other one we did, and it contains about the, the eight best minutes ever on um, – on, on DJ culture and DJ Wayne. Oh, really? Yeah, you just give it. Oh, I brilliant. don't remember what I said. No, you basically say, like, no one cares. Yeah, oh, no, no one cares. Yeah, Are people definitely. dancing? Yeah. Then fine. Was but that if- was that pre-pandemic yeah, that yeah. we did that? Yeah, it was Young Spack. Okay, can I add something to that? Please. Okay. When the pandemic happened and everyone decided, well, not everyone, but many DJs decided they were going to live stream their DJ sets, worst idea I've ever heard. Because? Well, because, uh, well, firstly, who cares, right? But secondly... You, you've taken everything about a nightclub that, you know, is is enjoyed through the context of being in a nightclub, whether it's, you know, having drinks or being out or being with friends or the socialization or the decorations or the place and the music, and you've actually removed all of it except for the music. And so all you get at the end of it is just this person dancing in front of some vaguely complicated equipment and you channel that through a pair of laptop speakers. Of course that's going to be a shit experience. And I would really, some of the biggest DJs in the world were doing these live streams and I look on Twitter and there's like eight people watching. They're probably not even paying attention. It was a nightmare. And all it did was at the end of the day, I think, is it it, it actually highlighted how useless DJs was in, were in clubs anyway. So any any reputational capital that we had before the pandemic has now been completely set alight and hopefully people will forget that when nightclubs open up again. Uh, oh, they are. They're open again. No, I know they are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll show you some footage, actually. G was at a club in Paris the other night. Mm. And, like, fuck me. Because she, she turned 18 when the pandemic hit, you know? Right. And I, and I really felt for her because um, Megan The Stallion's um, Wet Ass Pussy came out, which would be the best song ever to dance to mm. on a dance floor. And there were no dance by floors. the time they got back out in the clubs, the song had gone. Yeah. You know, and and it was So like, when did she turn 18? Was it the beginning of the, the uh, lockdown or no, no, she was she turned 18 so maybe we still have out in like another well how shall I put this? Lockdown showed up and I don't know how to throw her under the bus, man. It's, you know. There was parties going on mm. and she never had a chance to dance to that. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's such a seminal part of what you essentially I think we all chase that mm. again. Like when we go out, we're all chasing that feeling of what it was like. I never forget the first time I ever saw a DJ actually, actually DJ DJ was Norman Cook. I was like, oh, mm. that's what it is. Yeah. Right. I, oh, <laughs> my God. I thought it was like just terrible doof. I can't tell the difference between one and the next. Yeah. Um, but this is good. Mm. Oh, I like this. I like this. And it changed yeah. everything. But- I, I found that it was people, you know, the people that were born, oh, sorry, born, I shouldn't say born, but um, that were turned 18. Yeah. Around the time that the lockouts came in. Oh man! So, so I, I think that was 2014 or something. Yeah, was it, yeah. right? So, I would regard these this generation of people as the least fortunate when it came to their opportunities of going out because you had the the cross was dying a slow death. Everybody had to be out by 1:30 or, or whatever it was. Right? You had two years of that. Then you have the city becoming you know, prohibitively expensive for anybody who wants to live within five kilometres of it. So yeah, if you're a yeah. student or something like that, you're living in West Pennant Hills with your parents, living in a garage, yeah. and then taking a bus, of all things, right, out to a nightclub. And then you get hit with a pandemic. Yeah. No fun. Just forget it. Yeah. Just forget it. Just yeah. take up the piano or something. The, I guess, you know, what you were saying before about channeling things into literature and channeling things into speaking, Um in 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 a way, like the authority that the way you present visually gives whatever you have to say about resilience or dealing with an adverse moment or trying to cool your shit when you're angry about stuff you can't control, that instantly carries more weight and I dare say would break through a lot of preconceived biases. So that's just, in many ways, it's quite yes, a superpower I, you have. No, but I hate it as well, right? Because I don't right. want, I don't want people to take what I'm saying based on the fact that I've gone through, you know, such a horrible dis, you know, yeah. tragedy and a disability mm. and stuff like that. I, I want the words to stand on their own. I want the content to actually yeah. ring true. And so it's that thing again, right? Yeah. It's the DJing with hooks thing. I, I try pretty hard to piece together and, I guess, aggregate information that I think is not only accurate but relevant for people. Yeah. You know, and and a lot of it is steeped in lessons that I've learned myself. Yeah. Um, But I don't think that should be the reason that they take what I say on authority. 
I don't think that's a very good way of reasoning. That's fine. Mm. You don't have to think that. <laughs> you're good. You're going to do it for me. But it might be just yeah. the one chance that that person has of getting an idea into their brain without immediately writing it off. Sure. Because there's like a second before the gate closes. Yes. And they but go, oh, no, fuck it. Yeah, yeah, sure. But then you, you have to be willing to accept a lot of bad ideas by people who have similar types of authority visually or, or for some true. reason. Um, you remind me a lot of Dan Ariely. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That's very nice. Is it that, because of the scars? Or the- well, no, 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 no. No, not at all. In the way that he is not his experience. Mm. You know, interestingly, I went to see him speak uh, here in Sydney many years ago. He, he spoke at the, the Masonic Centre. Did you know that existed? I had no idea. This You're never going to get in, man. How are you going to do the handshakes? Yeah, exactly. Fucking hell. <laughs> They're like, sorry, we can't take, we can't sorry, tell you like, why. There's an apron involved. <laughs> Handshake. How do we do yeah. <laughs> And um, the way the way I actually found out who Dan Ariely was many, maybe 10 years ago or so, yeah, yeah. was a TED talk that he gave where he talked about, uh, so he was burnt as a child. I think he was. Oh, uh, no, it was an accident. He was in the army and there was an accident with a mu- munition. Right, but it was a terrible. It was, terrible it was a burn, wasn't it? Yeah, it was it? horrible. Yeah, horrible yeah. Burn. yeah, yeah. Half his face, half his body. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and so the nurses at the time treated his skin in the same way that mine was, because mm. the way they treat meningococcal is like a burn. Yeah. And I had a very similar experience to him, where he said, uh, "Please rip the bandages off slowly." And the common wisdom was, "No, no, no. We we rip it off quickly, so there's this spike in bad experience, and then it's over." And he instinctually was like, mm, I, being the subject of this, he's like, I know that this is wrong. I want it to happen slower. And so he ended up, when he became a behavioral scientist, he he went and did a bunch of tests yeah. on that, yeah. working out uh, what was actually better. And, and he did it with, um, so he gave a bunch of colonoscopies to a bunch of people. And then I think what happened was with the, he, he had a control group and then he had another group where he would leave it in a little bit too long, uh, but he would pull it out. Uh, a little bit further, so it was more comfortable towards the end. And really, it turns out, if anyone's listening to this, yeah, like yeah. having you do, like visually do this is really <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> because it, I would we'll encourage get, you. We'll get one of the dogs in to demonstrate. If <laughs> <laughs> you got a thermometer, and what he he worked out was that people care far more about the ending of something than yeah. they do of the overall experience. So if the ending wasn't too uncomfortable, they regard the whole experience, whether it was longer or shorter, yeah. as a better experience overall. And I think his findings were that, yeah, if you are ripping Band-Aids off, actually doing it uh, uh, really slowly uh, is is better. I wish I had that information when I was in hospital to present yeah, yeah. to them. It's like, watch this TED Talk. Yeah. Please don't rip bandages off me like that. It's a great, it's a great, it's a really great yeah. point. You remind me of him in that you don't, you aren't, you draw from your experience, but mm. you aren't defined by your experience. And yeah. he, he walks with it every day. Yeah. You know, you, you go through the rest of his life looking like, you know, he had a bad time with a phosphorus munition, yeah, which yeah. he did. Um, but that's not, that's not who he is. So what would you say, you know, if I think about the time when I was most vulnerable to going down that kind of thinking, the kind of resentment, the kind of, uh, fuck, you don't know what it's like thinking. Mm. Um, it would have been, I was probably like anywhere between the age of 15 and 19. Right. All right. This is a dangerous time in any young man's life. It is, yeah. What would you say to young or parents of young men or any young men? Listen, I ask specifically about young men, not young women. What would you say to them about, you know, those tempting feelings of, you know, the safety of resentment or the safety of being angry at the world? I would probably say that you're only doing yourself a disservice, um, which is, uh, even though it feels like something that is a priori or something that you, a knee-jerk reaction to anything, you know, it, it harks back to that idea of, you know, nobody cares about your life as much as you do. So all of those feelings of resentment that you might hold, uh, while you think they're having an effect or a second order effect, at least in the world, they absolutely are not. And if anything, they have a negative effect. And so you you need to work out ways that are actually going to benefit you. And sometimes benefiting you is benefiting people around you because, you know, social connections are the most important things in our lives when it comes to our subjective well-being. And so being somebody that other people can depend on, having a sense of responsibility, someone that other people can lean on can often make you a more robust person, I guess, in general. And it also gives you a sense of purpose. And I I think people without the sense of purpose can spiral into depressive states, although I'm I'm not a psychologist, but that's what I read. A sense of purpose is something that we all had Mm. before 
you know, the, the convenience of modern farming and modern medicine. Mm. And that purpose was get enough food and water. Mm. That we all had something to do. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that yeah. was really it. Yeah. And we haven't, we basically, you know, developed agriculture and our bodies and our mm. brains are nearly exactly the same as they were sure. 100,000 so many but, years ago. But purpose in and of itself is a, is a, it's a cognitive program that you run in your head, yeah. right? And so you have the ability to imbue anything with a sense of purpose. Mm. And it's kind of why I hate people that say, not the people, but I hate it when people say everything happens for a reason. I don't like that. Because, well, I mean, apart from being nonsensical and just generally an, a non sequitur idea, I think it robs you of being able to imbue anything with a sense of meaning yourself, mm. which is Almost the exact thing that's going to carry you over and give you a sense of purpose is to imbue meaning upon things that happen. And the distinction, as you point out, you know, between that which you can control and that which you can't control is the difference between a life of stagnation and success, I guess. The uh, everything happens for a reason. There's, in my mind, there's a, there's a bracket that says that you give it after the fact, close bracket. Mm. Mm. And that's the reason that you then reverse engineer to justify essentially the feeling in your body when the thing happened. Yeah, that's true. And it's important to to make the distinction that we're talking, we're speaking philosophically here, not as though uh, everything happens for a reason. If I knock a glass off the table, yeah, it happened because I did it. Yeah. So, you know, there are real world reasons that things happen, but in yeah. terms of the philosophically underpinning reason that things but occur. The, le the leap to understanding what you just described, the mm. leap to understanding that you're the one that puts the meaning on it, mm. that requires a level of reflection that might be uncomfortable because you might have to face the fact that, oh, I'm the one that's making this shit. Yeah, yeah. You, and that's the realisation that you're the one that shapes your own reality. Yeah, that can be very hard for some people and it's, oh, yeah, no shit. it's easier yeah. to, you know, kind it of- It should be hard, but nothing good was ever easy. But what would you say to people about about that concept, the idea of, you know, oh, you, you actually, this, this thing is really annoying you. Mm. And it's uncomfortable to realize this, but you're the you actually are deciding that this is annoying right now. Mm. You can decide for it just as easily to be not annoying. You can reframe it. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, which is an important skill to develop you know, because it's not and, and reframing isn't a, a, it isn't an exercise in lying to yourself about the realities of things that have happened. Yes, like you get hit by a bus and you're like, great, now I know. <laughs> Come on, you know, horrible shit happens all the time, mm. uh, and it doesn't mean that. If something is, you know, seven bad, that you're going to find something seven good about it. You might only get something three good out of that. But it there's a snowball effect that that has. And, and the idea of getting good at reframing things is a skill. And that skill creates momentum. And the momentum means that you get exponentially better at doing that thing. And so it becomes like a superpower, I guess, in the future where, you know, 10 years down the track, you might find that you're only getting better in little increments as you go along yeah. uh, and you lose sight of the bigger picture. You ought to lose sight of the bigger picture, right? Because I think the bigger picture is sometimes yeah. ambiguous and, and can lead you down the wrong path. I, I mean, I like to live in a way that I don't know what's really happening a year from now. I kind of like that. I take uh, every situation in front of me because opportunities can come up and they lead you down a completely different path, a path that you didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. And that could be way better than what you thought you were going to do when you were setting goals, right? <laughs> Which I think is a bullshit way to live your life. There's a guy called Tim Ferriss. You know who Tim Ferriss oh, is? I know. Tim Ferriss, you stumbled yes. upon him before? Well, he developed a thing called fear setting which I use in, in my life all the time, which I think is way better than goal setting, which is that you you line up on a piece of paper in a, a grid all of the things that you fear from different outcomes, and then you actually just workshop what you would do in the best and worst case scenario. And the first time I heard about this, I was like, oh, it's kind of a bullshit, you know, pop psychology thing. I started doing it. It was phenomenal, actually, because all it did was put your mind to rest at what your B and C and D plan would be if all of these bad things happen. Yeah. And so protecting against that, still, you weren't setting goals such that you were you had this narrow framing and you weren't open to opportunities, but you were sort of protected against the negative in a way. It's a very, um, uh, very military way of going about things. Because that, that, that great military line is like, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Mm. There's a, like, there's literally like 57 different exits. And I think uh, when I when I ride the motorbike, mm. um, 
one of the one of the kind of training things that I've you know, I've uh, uh, been learning is that, you know, this is where I want to go. Mm. And at every single point, that's where I go if things go bad. And that's where I go if things go bad. And as I move 100 meters down the road, now this car's here, this car's there, this car's mm. there. Okay. okay, that's my escape line. That's my escape line. You know, and they're just constantly yeah. being like, so when it happens, yeah, like, it's cool. Yeah. I, it's one less decision I have to make. And I'm, mm. I'm less, you know, bothered essentially because my brain already kind of knows mm. what to do. It's really, it's the memento mori of plans. Yeah. It it's is, like, yeah. Let's, let's focus on this not yeah, working. absolutely. Because the idea, because the thing, the, the goal setting thing, it's um, it's very binary and it can really mm. lock you into, I did it with uh, Breakfast Radio. I'm like, and then I went and I pushed, just just, just put, kicked every obstacle out of the way and got mm. there and went, ah. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't and what I thought know, it was going to be. When other people have their fingers in the pie, you set a goal. Yeah. And when other people have their own machinations that are happening and they can fuck with and move the goalposts, right, you you have a tendency to get disheartened by the fact that you haven't reached it. Hmm. You know, and that's ridiculous in a way, right? Yeah. I remember when I first was learning to walk again using prosthetics and uh, I was at this hospital on the coast. It used to be called the Coast Hospitals. It's called Prince Henry when I was there. Uh, largely abandoned except for a couple of wards. But it had uh, – the whole place was had a kind of Shutter Island vibe about it, uh, but there was a golf club that was um, about 800 metres or a kilometre down, down the road. And considering how awful the hospital food was, uh, it was a great place to go for lunch. Yeah. Some respite, culinary respite, I guess. Respite from respite? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And um, I, I'd already been up and walking with the help of uh, – a wardsman type mm. person. And so it was about endurance at this point. So we're like, we're going to walk all the way to the golf club. And it was kind of a steady decline down a bitumen road and it was featureless and you could sort of see all the way down to the end and it looked really long. And I remember getting so disheartened. I remember I was halfway there and I, I made the ill-advised decision to sort of stop and get regain my composure ill-advised because standing is often more difficult with prosthetic legs than walking because you're not giving rest to each leg as you're striding. And I remember sitting there and looking down what would have been maybe 500 metres left to go, and it just looked so long. And I thought, you know, if I had the end goal in mind, I would never get there because I would be com completely disheartened by the whole exercise. And it was only because as you're walking with prosthetic legs because you can't feel the terrain and the terrain and the topography actually has a lot to do with how you walk on prosthetics. And so I'd have to watch the floor in front of me uh, just to see if there are any dips in the topography or whatever it is. And I realized what I would do is I'm keeping my eye on the road in front of me, but I would have these little milestones as I would go. It's like, just walk to this thing and just walk to that thing and just walk to the next thing. And I didn't look up the whole time. And I got there way faster than I thought I would. And I, by the time I reached the end, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm here. And so I started using that technique for everything that I did everywhere I walked. It was just like, just focus on the thing that's in front of you. Mm -hmm. Forget about what's up. you got a vague just, direction I'm going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I yeah supermarket. Yeah, yeah. Supermarket. <laughs> yeah. I'm going that direction. Yeah. Well, yeah, man, that, that could have been good as well. It could have been, they might have had something I wanted there. Yeah. And so I, I use this technique with everything now, and I use it in my, in work. I use it in my social, anything. Just focus on what's in front of you and do the best at what's in front of you. And things fold out. Like, everything's always fine. <laughs> I always end up sitting here talking to you, so it can't be that bad. Tell me about this idea that everything's always fine. Oh, everything's always fine. But there's no idea. It's just everything's always fine. Everybody thinks that shit is getting real or getting really bad. I, I started doing this thing a couple of years ago, which I want to revisit, which is stop watching the news every day, but just start reading publications that happen every month and see what effect it, it has on your life, right? And I did this for, oh, I, I think I kept it up for three or four months. And it had a marked effect on on my demeanor. I was much happier because I wasn't subject to that if it bleeds, it leads type news story that's constantly trying to pump fear into you about geopolitical things or, or you know, social stuff, whatever it is. And you just read these monthly publications that summarize, you know, here's all the stuff that actually was important last month. Yeah, everything's fine. <laughs> everything's fine. Stop complaining. 
There's, there's people <laughs> listening right now going, but Tom, you don't understand. Yeah, like, that's right. I got yeah. this, I got my hex debt, and I got, I can't get it right. Like, my yeah. rent went up 100 bucks last week. I'm yeah. Like, like, how's everything fine when, you know? How's it not? We're still alive. Is that what you got? To? Yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's strange, right? Because you can always look at your life from two different perspectives. You can look at it like, oh, you know, there's always someone worse off than me, and so I feel better. And then you can also say there's so many people that are better off than me, so should I feel worse? So I think that's that's a useless way to look at life. You know, just look at it in terms of how you are today and how you were yesterday and try and improve that. I can't get that far. I can't go all the way to the golf club. You can. <laughs> but can I get there? I can get there. Yeah. And you know what? I'm fine. Mm. How about over there? Two more steps. I can get there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm And fine. then just keep doing that. It's very hard when your brain, and I know this because it happened to me, when your brain's not working properly, it's very hard to not be in that sense of totality. Mm. It's very, very, very hard to yeah. see things at a granular level and be present to yeah, absolutely. this moment right here is actually okay. Yeah. But getting to that place is the, for me, that has got to be the, that's the secret sauce. Right and also there. it harks back to what you were saying about when we we're talking about the hedonic treadmill kind of thing before, which is the idea of savoring the moment rather than just worrying about what the goal is and only mm. being happy once you get to the, mm. the end goal. And some people don't even do that because they're so sort of driven. They're kind of like, okay, yeah. what's the next thing? Oh, dude, I've done that. Like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's empty and meaningless. It's just like vacuous. It's awful. Yeah. When you get to the point where it's funny, because I remember taking my dog for a walk once and this is years ago and I'm, you know, dogs don't give a shit about the water. They want to sniff everything, right? Yeah. All they want to do is sniff because that's like reading the news for them, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm walking And they haven't and I, been there for a month. So yeah, there's a lot to smell. There's a lot of news, right? Yeah. And so he's walking along and he literally stopped to smell the roses. And I was like, oh, man, he's an, he's an idiot, right? But I've got things I can learn from that dog. <laughs> and, um, and I think to myself, you know, like how often do I – actually just sit and appreciate where I am, not where I'm going. Uh, and since then, I always have. I do all the time. To a point where it's annoying <laughs> to other people. <laughs> right. <laughs> Does it bother people around you when you're in a heightened situation? Perhaps, like, let's say, for example, if you were in an altercation with a significant other and mm. things are getting quite emotional and you're like, yeah, man. Does it bother? I'm not. I don't have too many altercations with significant other. Uh, but I, I'm definitely irritating to her. Absolutely. Yeah. On many levels. How? Um, oh, just constant whining. Yeah. I just you sit ahead for an hour telling me everything's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what do you whine about? Okay. Well, I whine about two ply tissues. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I whine about, uh, I, I whine about all of the small things and I do it constantly. Uh, like for instance, I will drop an object and there's something in the fucking universe. It always goes to the most inconvenient. Like, I'll drop this jewel. It'll go on the floor and it will go underneath the couch as far away from, from my life as I can get, right? That's just that's just my piece. Every door is against me, weirdly, I found recently. Uh -huh. When I try and open a car door, it's always closing back in on me. Uh, so, yeah, just little things like that. Also, you know, the place that I live. I was talking to someone about this the other day on a podcast. I need to live in a place where I hate 20% of it for some reason, right? Because if I loved everything about where I lived, I would have nothing to complain about. That's part of my identity. You want identity? That's part of my identity. <laughs> so 20% of it is like... It's about that. It's it's like a Pareto distribution, like some weird kind of, I need to complain 80% about 20% of this shit. Is my right. Life. Yeah. So just being a little bit fucked off at stuff yeah. fuels you to do other things? Absolutely. No, well, it, it, just, it just makes me, it gives me purpose. And what is that? Just to complain about things. No, what's the purpose? What does it give you the purpose of? <laughs> Literally that, to complain about things. Because I'm, I'm pretty good at it. Yeah, yeah. There aren't too many things that I'm good at. That's one of them. But when I actually have a, an idea for a book called "The Hundred Things I Hate and Why I Hate Them." Bestseller immediately. Let yeah. me sign. I don't even own a publishing company. It's, I yeah, I've, I think I already told Penguin about it. They're like, mm, let's see how the first one goes. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, thank you for. Uh, you've got a quote on the I back do. of my book. I'm grateful, you and uh, and also uh, in the acknowledgements because you you told me that. What uh, that line that you said 
which stuck with me all those years, which is as soon as you've got a book deal, treat it like it's your it's, job. It's your job. That was Ben Law told me that. Right. Okay. Well, okay. do you want me to change it to him then? <laughs> Immediately recall every every <laughs> recall, book, yeah, destroy yeah. everything, yeah. put the draw press through them. Yeah. But I did that. So in in 2019, I think I I went to France for maybe four, four or five months in in total. Over yeah, a couple the, times of the, the year. The most accessible of all fucking cities in I the know. world is Paris. But that's, see, there you go again, right? I love everything about Paris except for the accessibility oh that pisses me off. It's fucking worse. But you get to complain about it with the French, no less, who are the and, best at complaining. My gosh. And then there's the, the strikes and the, you know, yeah. it's great like that. That's why I love it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, I'm, I'm glad that you, you wrote all this down. Um mm. You've got a lot to give, Tom. A long, way, way, way more than, you know, Agua shots over a fucking bar in William Street, mm. which I took for the team, I will point out. We did ag- Agua? Yes, we did. Don't, what's I don't what's, what's Agua? It. Something made out of something. I don't know. That's, oh, it's made out of the leaf that they make cocaine out of. Oh, uh, the, coca, the coca leaf. Yeah, they make it out yeah. of coca leaf. Oh, really? Well. Agua, it's a spirit made out of that. Ah, so yeah. that's your excuse for it was... It, no. it was the drink. It wasn't. It was. I didn't mean much. Excuse. Um, <laughs> but no, you got you got a lot, you got a lot to give, man. And 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 it takes a lot to choose to be public about it. And while you have been, you know, you know, self depreciating, telling me that you just like to complain about things, mm. um, if that gives you the place to stand to speak a truth to people who mm. otherwise um, wouldn't hear it. I'm glad yeah. that you're choosing to do so because you don't have well, to. Well, if they choose to listen, then I'm lucky. Well, you don't this. have to choose a life of facing public, but you do. Mm. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. And I'm grateful that you do. Okay. Because, right. no, well. no, really, I am. Because it's a, there's a lot you, you're an important voice in Australia. And I'm, I'm grateful that you've, you, you're choosing this path, man. I hope I continue to be. I hope you <laughs> keep giving your prosthesis challenges beyond measure. If I go off the rails, you'll let me know, won't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Also, if you'd like me to text you every time I find something to complain about, I can also do that. So you can get a well-rounded view of what I mean by that. If you can make it rhyme, yes. No, I'm not doing that. See? There you go. Barrier what to a, entry. Just a small poet? barrier to entry. What about, I'm not making things rhyme for you. What do you mean? I sit here, Osher, and I cry. <laughs> Once again, this fucking toilet's got to ply. See? Easy, mate. Right. That was... Firstly, that was terrible, but it did. I would rhyme. take it. it <laughs> I would take it as like there's effort. Okay, so you because want, it also you makes you complain reflect upon fucking haiku. It also makes you reflect message. upon how fucking shitty and trivial the thing is you're complaining to me. Oh, about. I don't need to reflect. On that. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> oh, glad you came around, man. Thanks, Thanks for having me again. See you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for sitting in my little dark room under my house. By the way, I have to call. Danny now, because he's going to come. I'm having him over for dinner this uh, t- tonight. Oh, yeah? Hey, Siri, call Danny Clayton. Are we? Let's leave this on the podcast. Right. Is he back? He's back from Bali, clearly. Yeah. So. He looked like he had a terrible time. <laughs> I wasn't watching. Hello? Hello. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm uh, spectacular, Tom. How are you doing? Good. Are you okay? <laughs> Thank you. Are you, uh, are you coming over here so we can lift you to Stanmore? Yeah. I'm, uh, or do you want us to pick you up? I can come there. From whatever sorted outside. grief hole you currently reside in. Did Drop you have me. a nice time in Bali, Danny? Oh, God, it was the best. Well, that sounds very loaded. What's happening? <laughs> no, I'm just asking. Was it good? It was brilliant. It was glorious. It um, was silly. It was fun. It looked fun. Um, yes. All right. Well. Um, so if, if you like, I can either make my way to your place or um, if web- it's easier, swing by mine. Yeah, maybe we'll swing by yours because by the time you get here, I'm not going to be standing out on the street like an asshole for like 40 minutes. Look, I've made you do it before. And, uh, exactly. And once bitten, twice shy. So okay. I'll just come nice. to your place. Um, shame on you. Um, this okay. is a bad well, idea. In that case, uh, I will be at mine. Come, uh, come get me. I'll send you my address again. Come, okay. come get me, baby. Come get me. All right, I'm going to let these guys go, and they're going to come get you, and you're going to have a lovely deal, lovely dinner. All right, sweet. See you bye, man. Bye. 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 bye.